psychology. It's more than a philosophy, more than a psychology, more than just an ecology, bigger than biology, larger than anthropology, brushes against astrology. That's prophecology. So we have a brother, this is the husband of Shalin, and she's the one that does the audio books with us, and his name is Rashidi, did I pronounce that right? Yes, sir. And very interesting person. Uh, um, Elder Brad, what would you say about Rashidi? First of all, he is a connector, right? So he finds people who work in the same circle and puts them together so that they make a product that is viable for the market. Mm. He works in, uh, in musical circles, in marketing circles, very versatile. Um, he is one of those guys where if he gets in the room, in 10 minutes he'll figure it out. Wow. Yeah, yeah he's that guy. All right, let's give Rashidi a hand. God bless you. So um, tell us a little bit of some of the projects, Rashidi, you have done. Uh, well, you know, when I first started in the entertainment industry, I was in the music industry first. Mm -hmm. So coming from the music industry, uh, um, I thought that I, I could make a bridge into film and television. Okay. Um, and, you know, after working in the music industry for like about 10, 15 years, um, I became really interested in the the music of film and TV, you know, film and television music. So if I'm understanding, so you're talking 10 to 15 years, this is like in the 1990s? Well, yeah, in, 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 the, in the early 90s and then going all the way to about 2005, 2006, okay. um, I got really excited about just film and TV music. You know, I, I discovered that that was a whole industry where you can take music and license it in television shows and films, TV commercials, uh, video games, movie trailers. Oh wow, video games. You can make money out of video games doing music. Yeah. Oh yeah, so the licensing business, the area of the music industry I was in was called music publishing, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Mm -hmm. So music publishing basically is the business of managing copyrights. Um, copyrights uh, are just another word for a song. So when you're uh, a songwriter or a producer of music, a music publishing company will make sure that you get paid. How important is literary property? Because this is like the new gold or the old gold for some, because I remember first hearing about it when we first did our record, we had a record deal with Benson Records and they were talking about um, royalties and I used to hear words like mechanicals. Yeah, uh, yeah. Like mechanicals. yeah. And then shortly after that, I met Stanley Brown, who started, was doing some things. And we remember when his song was in New Jack City, like, and that was like really big. Like we know someone that got a song like in a movie, you know, and then he started doing some, um, um, I think some jingles or some things that ended up on TV shows rather. Yeah. So we find that that is phenomenal. Do you find that this has been like a real major resurgence during that period coming out of the 80s into the 90s and started building up? I think a lot of music producers and, com and uh, wanted to be what I call a composer. You know, it's, it's that transition where you go from just being a person who makes beats and, you know, can make a song versus now a person who can do everything and compose. Mm -hmm. uh, I was really attracted to that, you know, coming from the music industry. And because I was a big fan of films and TV shows, I felt like there were a lot of people who were curious about it, but didn't know how to do it. So once I got into music publishing, I started to be kind of somewhat of a, kind of a, 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 an expert of trying to help people make that transition. And I think it got very popular uh, in the mid 2000s um, because I found that a lot of the music producers that were producing for a lot of artists, 
uh, especially like hip hop artists and things like that, they found they were very frustrated and they'd have a catalog of music that they couldn't get placed on anybody's album. So all of the music supervisors who are the people who were uh, in charge of the music for TV shows and films, they would say, hey, you know those songs you made like five years ago? Give them to me and I'll put them in. And then all of the music producers were like, wow, I just made $10,000 just off a song, I, a, a, tra a beat that I produced 10 years ago. Wow. You know, so it got very popular. And now, I mean, pretty much, I would say most of the music producers now are, the, uh, film and TV is a big part of their repertoire. You know, I remember um, he was a deacon at our, at our church, Larry Smith. I don't know if you ever heard. Oh uh, yeah, Larry Smith he used to do all the Run DMC stuff. Right. right. So he was a he was <laughs> okay okay. He, Actually, he produced the first Run DMC albums. Right. I never met him, but I know who he is. He was a deacon at my church. We had the same wow. birthday. Really. Okay. Um, yes. So Larry Smith, um, the late Larry Smith, he's he's gone on to be to be with the Lord. He came to church, got saved, got baptized, and everything. And he was a deacon in the church. Okay. And Larry, Deacon Larry, he um, got in a situation. We ended up going to court with him, and he was in the in in jail. During that season, he was in jail. We started seeing these large type checks come from Larry Smith. We said, "How is Larry?" paying tithes from jail. This was like unbelievable. I forget who it was that started using his beats from back in the day. Um, and all of a sudden, his old beats ended up on some of these new rappers' songs. Yeah. And it just kept going on and on and on. And you're talking about the tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars that was just made because of something they had. They didn't think that anybody would pick up a couple of bars and it made a difference in their life. Yeah. And I, that's when I started using the term, you can make money in your sleep. Well, you know, if you really think about it, it's just another form of intellectual property. Mm -hmm. So if you think about the world of IP, IP, you know, such as if you are, you know, write books like you yes. do, um, or if you make music like David does. Well, he was yes. here. Um, you know, if you're if you're a person that, you know, uh, maybe owns uh, apartment buildings, it's very much. It's all the same concept. It's all about assets and a lot of the things that you talk about um, that I've heard in your. Um, prophecies, you know, is about how do you own assets? How do you, yeah. how do you make residual income? You know, yes. and that's one of the things that I think I really understood early, you know, and I wanted to be a part of that yes. monetary system. I wanted to be a part of the, you know, the guy who just wakes up and, you know, there's a check in the mailbox, Yeah. you know, and, and I think that's what attracted me to eventually moving from music to film and television um, because I felt like there is a there's a, a uh, an opportunity just to be attached to IP. Wow, you know, you know and, and for those of you just tuning in, we're talking to Rashidi, and one of the things is that um, we discovered is that this is something that is so insightful um, to me because I've started looking at that there's three, three ways to ge generate money. One is tangible resources. That's like gold, silver, you know, dollars, you know, stocks, bonds, tangible resources. Then there's intangible, intangible resources. This is what we're talking about here. These are resources that's not tangible. You can't touch it mm -hmm. per se, but it does exist. Every prophecy we give you is intellectual property. Yeah. It's a spoken word. And it has a value. Right? Written judgments is intellectual property. I had somebody this weekend, um, a journalist, that came up to me and says, a major radio personality, and says, We understand that you prophesied about the virus and you prophesied about some more things to come. I want to interview you. Um, what do we need to do in our community? And said, so We've been watching your prophecy for the last 13 months. Although this was something you spoke about decades ago, 
but we're walking in it, and you called out the seasons of when it was safe, when it was unsafe, different things like this, and was beginning to, which was shocking but not shocking, from a secular area, saying, asking me, like, what are the next moves? Because right now, everything has opened up. In the state that she lives in, nobody's wearing a mask nowhere. And I says, well, we told people that towards the end of April, you watch the center right here, Prophet Stephen, yes. that it would be in a safe zone. Yes. And we'll be safe until October 6th. Yeah. Around October 6th, the wheels are going to turn. And then we're going to rush towards the next phase of the pandemic that's going to be worse than the last two. And, you know, people kind of look and say, it don't look like that in sight now. You don't hear about a whole lot of cases now. But this is the calm that is before the storm. How do you know that? I'm a prophet. Um, we're going to hit the, the, the peak of that in around February. We'll, we'll hit the peak of that in February. And now we'll go February until about May or so. But in that, there's going to be a great loss of life. And, but there are things that we can do to get in front of that season so that, therefore, we're not taken out by it, but it's something that we're able to lead into. So what are some of the projects that you have recently been working on. And then I'm going to ask you, what are some of the things that you see changing in the industry since COVID? Um, yeah, um, I think the, well, the, the project that's recently that I've done, um, I did an, I, a documentary based off of uh, former Run DMC JJ, Jam Master J, the late Jam Master J, mm -hmm. um, who unfortunately passed away uh, in 2003 uh, due to gun violence. Um, his case was never solved, mm -hmm. um, which kind of left uh, a lot of doubt and belief that um, justice can be attained um, in, within the hip hop community. Right. It was one of the things, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you could say maybe Jay-Z, I mean, excuse me, uh, Biggie and Tupac, you could say uh, Big L, there's a lot of things that happened uh, maybe 10 years before that with artists that had died and no, n none of the There's cases no were solved. There's no justice. So, Oops. Uh, so uh, I would say around 2020, last year, uh, around August, um, they found the two guys that shot Jam Master J. And it was just by sheer coincidence that we had already started doing the documentary and that we inserted that... Um. In, that information into the doc, which which kind of made it fresh, um, mm. and 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 current, you know. Mm. So the case went from being a, a local NYPD case to now being um, a federal case. Wow! And where could people see this documentary at? Um, Hulu. So it's on Hulu. Uh, it was also on uh, the ABC app as well because ABC was my partner on on the project. So, um, but if you want to find it, you can find it on Hulu. Wow. So you just put in, set the record straight, the Jam Master J case. So if you put in Jam Master J, it'll come up. Wow. Is there a need for product and content today? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what is really interesting is that if you think about where we were 30 years ago, we only had four channels. Really, you know, three. You know, you, you're right. Um, let me say, CBS, NBC. ABC. CBS. You could say PBS, ABC. too. Right. Technically. Yeah. And then, and then we went. I technically, say PBS. Too. And then we went from the, and then we went from there. Had about five channels, right? You had Channel Five, well, in the New York area, Channel Two, Channel Channels Four, Channel Five, yeah, channel seven, seven, and nine, yep. right? Mm -hmm. And then Eleven kind of came up here yeah. shortly after that. Thirteen, nobody watched it, you know. <laughs> that, was the, that was PBS. Yeah, PBS. I mean, who watched PBS? I mean, as a kid, you know, you were not interested. And then back then, TV used to go off around one o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It was a, there was no TV. It was snow on the screen until about da, 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 four or five. Da, 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 they used to do the color, you know, the color, uh, <laughs> right. the Technicolor li um, grid, yes. you know, and then it would turn Ooh. off. Ooh. Yeah, you realize right. that, right? Right, right, right. Now, here we go from 
let's say seven channels, let's be generous, let's, let's say nine, mm -hmm. to now all of a sudden hundreds if not thousands. Yeah. And, and, and what, what happened, you know, with the um, advention of what we call streaming platforms allowed people to now create their own devices of content um, and be able to put right. that content online um, in the streaming platform. So you have streaming platforms, which we call SVOD, which stands for Subscription Video On Demand. Mm -hmm. So that's like Hulu, Netflix, Amazon, uh, HBO Max, uh, Paramount TV, a lot of these places where you have to subscribe. And then you have what's called AVOD, which is Advertised Video On Demand. That's yeah. your Roku, you know, your all of your OTT. So right. those are all ad supported, meaning that they have advertising. So what ends up happening is you don't have to be a person who is attached to a network. You can create your own content. You can find a, an AVOD platform, put your content on there, and you know, and literally you're in business. But obviously you still have to produce quality stuff. And you know, when you look at it now today, you have so much happening in television, um, media. Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody became a producer overnight because of a cell phone. That's right. Mm -hmm. Everybody became an author, right? I mean, I'm streaming right now and um, we're um, live on Facebook. I mean, who would ever thought that you can go live from your telephone, you know, you can capture something. And when I set my TV station, you know, television studio up at the church in the 1990s, 88, I remember going to the NAB show every year, April. Sure. NAB, I would go there and get equipment, see what the latest equipment were. And you know, you were paying like 15 to $25,000 for a camera back then. Mm -hmm. And then finally the, the price started going down, it going down to about 9,000. You need three cameras on a tripod with a man behind it. Then all of a sudden it felt like overnight, although it wasn't overnight. Now your telephone camera is just as sharp as a camera that you would have paid, that a person would have went to school for. And so now, and then I watch some of these young guys, we have a young man here, he's actually editing the footage. On his phone. On his phone. Yeah. And I remember I was sending people to school for Final Cut Pro, and had to sit in classes for six months. They don't sit in classes at all. They just sit and maybe watch a YouTube video for about 30 minutes, or just wing it and figure it out. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like, the children that are born, I mean, I had to go to school to learn word process and Microsoft Word, and the kids come out almost like typing by the right. time they're five years old and can figure out how to do PowerPoint. Yeah, I, mean, I think the content business, because of that, has allowed now the average person to say, hey, I want to create content, I want to be creative. And then the next step is figuring out where they're going to put it out or, or not. They could just put it out on their own social media. You know, right. they don't have to be as sophisticated to, let's say, put it on an A Vibe channel or you know maybe sell it to you know um, Amazon or whatever the case. They can just put it out themselves. So what that means now is that you know the competition for content, even amongst people who you would consider more amateur, is now they're competing with everybody else who's making content. So the the space is a little crowded, but. But, but the best thing that I would say a lot of content creators on my side of the business say that, you know, it's refreshing because now we just have more places to sell. Yeah. You know, like we have more, like when, when somebody says, hey, you know, I have a great idea for a TV show, the list only used to be like three or four places at one point. Now that list can have 15 options to pitch, pitch a, pitch a show, You know, is great. That is so... So, you know, there was a book that I had gotten a hold of. I made, um, um, I made um, our people, I went and got it um, years ago. Uh, but it was a, um, what was the name of the book? It dealt with um, 
that we were dealing with the age of the, um, is it like the cult of the amateur? It's some, it, it dealt with the fact that we were coming into, now this was in the early 2000s, where they began to deal with um, the custer, the, the new professionals became the amateurs of the day. We're actually seeing that today, where um, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here, I'm trying to think of, but they called it the, it was actually the age of the amateur. And um, oh, I hate that when I'm, oh, okay. So it was in the book, The, Cus the Cult of the Customer. Mm -hmm. And they dealt with the fact that the, um, the, the, the customer today is actually amateur producing content and doing content in the place or in the space where they became a new news reporter. Mm -hmm. By the time CNN, Fox News, or any of them got a person on a plane at the scene of the event, there was a person there with a camera. Watch this. A person just got shot. Here's the police officer. Here's the... You know, mm -hmm. that became the new news media because mm -hmm. it was beating the local news at the scene. Mm -hmm. And you begin to wonder if it wasn't for the upgrading of technology that we have today, would we be having places like Black Lives Matter and some of the pr brutality that we're seeing because we this year we turned everybody mm -hmm. into a news reporter. And so it has changed the way we are processing. It's changing the way we see the world through a different lens. Yeah, we, um, we've allowed ourselves to now be connected only by the limit of the camera, you know? Mm -hmm. And there's, 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 no, there's, no, uh, there's no way we can't capture these moments and not broadcast them to the world now. Mm -hmm. Like now that culture has been created Almost yeah. to the point now where, like, you know, I think for the rest of our lives, we're going to see police brutality on camera. I think we're going to see, you know, um, people, you know, people's, you know, I mean, I don't know what the next level of uh, people habits of, of, of TikTok is. But, yeah. you know, whatever that next TikTok is, it's going to be even more inviting of, of people's personal lives. I'm going to be honest with you. I go to TikTok for comedy. Now, there was a time I used to have to look at HBO comedy, right? Or you went to the Comedy Channel. Right. Today, you just go to TikTok. If I want to laugh, I want to like say, you know what? Let me just see what's happening on TikTok. I guarantee you're going to laugh within the first five. Someone's going to do something crazy or something silly. And that's one of the things that we've got to understand is that um, when we are in a world or um, in the media, uh, we are seeing that the world has shifted. Mm -hmm. And we're watching the shift in the world. We're watching the shift in the climate. Yes. And um, what would you say about this, Stephen, Prophet Stephen? Because we are actually in a world that is actually transitioned. Yes. Um, I, in particular, when it comes to technology, Master Prophet, um, I see that... There's, here's a few things that when you mentioned with TikTok, I thought of the, the focus is going to be quicker. You know, you laugh within a minute, seconds, and then you moved on to another theme. And the other thing, too, is that with the age of technology, everything is so swift. So, so in some Jordan cases, Jordan. it takes the focus off. People are not as focused as they want to. They easily get bored because they want fast information and want it right away. Yeah. So that is, can be a challenge. And, you know, we've seen a change in culture. So the other day, I was at a Louis Vuitton store. And these, it was shortly after 3 o'clock, these children were like, they were about 14 years old, mm -hmm. a bunch of kids. You figure, like, what are they doing in Louis Vuitton? I mean, like, really? Like, right. what are you doing paying Louis Vuitton, right? 14 year old. You know, and the guy says, um, these are internet children. 
They got their own business on the internet, doing something. Mm -hmm. Influencers. I mean, that becomes a new PR person, right? You have influencers. I mean, and influencers are making a lot of money from endorsements. Oh yeah, yeah. And and you know, influencers, you know, at times are really not necessarily qualified people, but they're just people that have the the the, the bandwidth. They have that yes. that network you know, which is really interesting, so. That's why I, th I think the name of the, the cult of the amateur, right? Because what it was, it was showing how the amateur has become the new PR firm, mm -hmm. has become the new news reporter, mm -hmm. has become the new songwriter, you know, like, has become the new actor. This person has never gone to school for acting, and all of a sudden, they're creating their own content, mm -hmm. and they found an audience that would follow them. But they, that's but that's the thing, though, with a lot of the influencers is that you always, you they they haven't necessarily had enough. Sometimes the time served in the first in the area that they're experts in, mm -hmm. technically quote unquote experts. So you always have to kind of make sure that you know whatever they're, whatever they say that they're influencing, and in, it's not just based off of the followers. Because a lot of time it's just followers, and it's not necessarily the, the 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 time served or the equity in learning that particular craft. Right. That's what I found with a lot of the the uh, you know so-called influencers. But see, this is this is a, and that's the case in point. So we're in the age of the immature are being paid for their immaturity, because it's, you think about. It, I mean, they're doing reality shows with no makeup, so. Right. I think when we used to be at television, we didn't dare go to television without makeup, get the shine off your face, you know, all the right, things. Right. Sure, sure. Right? Today, people want to see the shine. They want to see that it's not made up for some reason. They don't want to see perfection. They want to see the imperfection. Mm -hmm. It's like that became the... Uh, they like the raw footage. Yeah. And, you know, and we should have seen that when, um, when they made the movie Blair Witch... Yeah, yeah, and it went crazy. We should have known then. That was a prophetic word. Absolutely. Blair Witch started doing something where um, Blair Witch started. Somebody took a camera and went in the woods. I never forget. I was so upset that I had um, went and looked at this whole movie. Right. And it was a jittery camera. And yeah, and I'm. All the time. You know, yeah. and I'm sitting there saying, where's the witch in the picture? Right. You know, the witch was the producer because they tricked us out of millions of dollars. And <laughs> they had this handheld camera. Ca a handheld camera. Right. And it made it to the silver screen. It made a lot of money. It made a lot, it made of, a lot money. of money. And it, did it cost them 100000 maybe less than 100000 to make that project? Yeah, I think it, it didn't a, even cost that much. I thought, I think it, like, cost, it was what, a student film, yeah. I think, originally, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was like 25000 yeah, yeah. or something. Yes. Yeah. You know, something that any one of us could have done. Absolutely. And made millions of dollars, which I think then the market was showing us, is not about how good your product is. And I'm not taking anything about perfection or taking away. It's about how good the marketing is. Mm -hmm. the package, yeah. The package. Yeah. How important, I mean, because you're in film. Yeah. How important is marketing? Well, I think, <laughs> uh, you know, for a film like that, they were able to create a, they were able to create a cult following of people. Okay, see, now, that, now, so the now there you go, right. there you go. There, see, say that again. See, now you're coming right down my alley right, right. here. They were able to create a what? A cult following. A cult following. And we've got to get used to that word cult. Yes. Because if you don't build a cult, you're not going to be rich. Right. You, look, it's a point. If you, Holly Davidson, now you know, I, I teach this in my business coaching. I do business coaching with 12 sure. people a year. And I have works that we don't release out here because y'all would really, you know, not have anything to do with me. But, um, if you don't build a cult, you're not gonna be rich. Right. And you that's what they did. You know, they, they were able to, they were able to use a, a concept, like you said, that probably any of us could have made, but w was able to put it in a platform and then, of course, it took a few people to, to earmark it and give the thumbs up. 
to be able to get it in that platform. And that's what happened. So it's, it's, that's the recipe yeah. for their success, you know. And once you can get the buy-in, you know, all you need is one person to say, yeah, let's, let's try that out and see if there's a market for it. Yeah. The rest is history. Yeah. I mean, that's what happened with Run Athletics. When Run Athletics came out, we gave a prophetic word to Reverend Run, who says that you're going to save the souls of men. And um, we said it's going to be the souls of people's feet. They came to him. They showed him a show. And I told him that's it. He took it to um, Jam Master J and um, Daryl McDaniel. Mm-hmm. They were both at the church. Well, Daryl was at the church. Jam Master J would come and visit. And they said, we don't want no part of it. It looks like, they said, the word on the street is it looks like an orthopedic shoe. The big shell, you know, in the front. Of. Mm-hmm. I said, you can make millions of dollars off of this. He says, Prophet, what should I do? I said, run with the shoe, it's gonna be a hit. For whatever reason, it took off. And it got that farm sold. The shoe was an ugly shoe. But no uglier than um, the big clogs that people wear in the street. Right. Uh, what do you call them? The, the Crocs. Crocs, right? right. The Crocs are ugly, right? Yes, they are. But it's got to be a, probably a billion dollar company. Oh, oh, definitely. I knew they were big when I saw Croc stores popping up. When you start seeing the brick and mortar stores, that's when you were like, okay, the, those <laughs> in the UGG, the UGG brand. The UGG, oh, yes. my goodness. Once you, start seeing, once you started seeing those, you're like, okay, they must be doing something right. And, and then people put them on, they're like, no, they're really comfortable. Yeah, and, but you, when you think about it, marketing, and yet marketing is something that I think we as a culture have been weak in. Mm-hmm. We don't put, we, and I think this is where we got blindsided with intellectual property. We like to pay for stuff like, I was at an event not too long ago, and our people of our you was forming lines mm-hmm. and coming out with bags of Louis Vuitton merchandise. Yet, they will not put $1,000 for a consultant that will give them information that could change the trajectory of their life because they don't value right. Consulting. They don't, we, don't value, we don't value counseling. We don't value coaching, right? Many of us, you have to almost beg the artist to get a public relations person. And they would sit here saying, why are we paying them $10,000 a month for what? You know, to get you positioned in the marketplace and to help you manage your brand. Mm-hmm. And people don't realize how important a brand is. There's a saying in advertising that you, you have to um, see something 25 times before you recognize that it actually exists. Meaning, let's say there's a, a Nissan commercial. You might hear it as ambient noise while you're watching TV. You might go to the kitchen. You might go do something else. But after the 25th time, that's when you actually see the commercial with your eyes. And if you kind of use that logic with everything that we do in life, sometimes we miss opportunities because we haven't seen it 25 times. I did, I did send you something I'd love, you, maybe your audience would like to look at. Yeah, I sent it to your email. What did you send me? Uh, I sent you a, a map of the universe of media. It's the media universe. So, um, and it's basically like a, what we, I guess you call it a cardiograph uh, of all of the uh, media platforms and where they kind of relate to each other within the the uh, scope of the of the of the media limp plane. So. Oh my goodness. So you know, if you wanted to share that with your audience. Oh yes, yeah. so let me um, get this to Obed. Did, did we send it to Obed? No, I didn't. I didn't oh, have um, his email address. Hold on, let me. I don't um, know if he can put it on the. Uh, I could probably. The can over. I? I can text. I can. I should be able to text this to him. Yeah. He'll probably. Let me see if I can get this text. But it kind of gives you like a. Uh, kind of a grand 
look of it takes it to the legs. media universe as it kind of stands. Okay, Obed, did you get it? Not yet. Legs, you got it, right? Uh, I sent it to you? Okay, let's see, can we get that up? And now this goes into a, well, let me ask you this. When did you get into marketing? Well, originally, um, when I came into the music industry, I was doing marketing for tours. So I was a road manager, a tour manager, uh, and then that kind of spawned into packaging the tours and figuring out, okay, we don't want to pay for okay. this. Let's get, let's get um, uh, mystic juices to pay for it. So that's kind of how it happened. That's how I got into, okay. you know, it, was, was, it, it really was more like entertainment marketing, sponsorship, branding, and that's how I, that's how I originally wow. started in the business. Okay. Um, and then I realized that, um, you know, once you learn uh, the world of, of marketing, you really can apply it to pretty much anything in your life. And that was what was so powerful. Because a lot of people were like, well, why did you choose marketing? You went to college for engineering. That was your degree. I didn't go to business school. I went to engineering school. You went to school for engineering? I went to school for engineering. Yeah, that was my degree is in engineering. So I, I didn't go to school. But all the, all the business classes were my favorite. But, but I didn't go to business school. But you know, I felt that what I learned about marketing is that in order to be able to allow yourself to create other opportunities, you have to be able to find that marketing in it. You know, you are now talking my, you are speaking in my tongue. You are talking in tongues right now. You are, you know, you're, you're, you're rare to hear. And yet, with that, I would love to pick your brain about the future because in the old model, that's the one reason I cannot see myself going back into a brick and mortar church. Mm -hmm. I get it. You know, I think you, you know, I think people need the fellowship, and I think that that's good. Um, but there's churches for every level of consciousness. And, and I'm not saying it's a right or wrong, um, but I just think that we're getting ready to, we're shifting into a new world. And there's going to be those that's going to stay with the stage coaches, and there's going to be those that's getting the automobiles, and there's going to be those that's going to be in the rockets. Right. And you got to, you know, just know. You got to just pick your poison and be able to ride it out in that season. And each one of it will have its pros and cons. But um, if we begin to look at the world of marketing, um, let's pull this graph up and you can um, probably begin to um, tell us a little bit about what it is that you see. Absolutely. Um, so if you look at it, this is the media universe um, as it stands. So each planet, if you will, is a separate brand. So you, know, you might recognize some of them like Microsoft. Microsoft is a $1.9 trillion. Mm -hmm. So each number that's under there is actually the net worth of the company. Mm. Wow. Okay. So if you see Microsoft, you look under there, they own LinkedIn, Cloud Drive, GitHub, Office 365, which is what I use, and Xbox. So the numbers that are under it might be uh, how many subscribers or users. So if you look at Office 365, they have three, 38 million subscriptions. 38 million people subscribe to it every month. I'm one of them. Uh, and then you look at Samsung uh, in the middle, Facebook off the top right, all the way at the left is Amazon, which you it would expect to be a trillion dollar company. Um, and down at the bottom is Apple, all the way over to the right is Alphabet. Mm -hmm. So. If you look inside, um, you know, you'll see that some of these companies, which you think are pretty big, like Viacom, CVS, are nothing compared to what, if you look straight up, yeah. uh, Netflix, which is, uh, you know, 210 million subscriptions. So 210 people, 210 million people every month pay nine, $9.99. And Comcast. Now, it, 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 there's so much that can be said about that. That... That right there, um, I look at that chart there, I know where my partner base came from. 
and I was in that Comcast area wow. looking at the different networks they had to go on. And I could tell you when it started costing me, I was getting leads for like a dollar a lead, and it was cost me $5 a lead, $10, and $20 a lead. Mm -hmm. And then we came off because we could see the marketplace was changing. And that's when we knew the eyeballs was leaving the television and was moving somewhere else. Yeah. And when the eyeballs moved, we had to shift our model of marketing. Jesus says, I will make you what? Fishers, Fishers of men. Fishers of men. The pool today is not the sea of Galilee. The pool today is that graph you just showed us, the sea of companies that they've had monthly to subscribers. And that's why it was important for us to have monthly partners which are subscribers. Mm -hmm. If you don't have, the day you stop having new subscribers, this is what my mentor, Reverend Ike, taught me. The day you stop having new subscribers is the day your business dies. Wow. And every one of those markets have new subscribers coming on every day. Well, there's a thing in marketing called acquisition cost. It's the cost of retaining a customer, the cost of retaining a person, uh, and being able to say that uh, if that cost is a dollar, to buy that customer, you know, then what is the market value of what you're retaining? So if it costs you a dollar in advertising to retain that customer for them to eventually pay $9.99 right. a mm -hmm. month, you know, you always want your your cost to always be varied, you know, as far as what it costs to make to to retain that customer because it's not just about you know, getting them to subscribe but also keeping them. Keeping them. You know, and, and what's really interesting about the subscription kind of industry, I should say, is that there are so many people that have subscriptions that they're paying for and they may or may not watch it. You know, like I don't know. I don't know too many people that watch Hulu every single day. I, but then again, I do know some people that watch Hulu every or Netflix every single day, you know, but they're still paying for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, it, and, and, and it's a subconscious because they're not necessarily thinking about it. You know, because once it's debited out of their account, it's yeah, gone. Yeah, and I got a couple of things I need to get debited, undebited out of my account that has taken apps that I've oh my paid God. like three ninety nine a month for, dollar ninety nine a month for. I got a for. couple of those, and you think of the money, it's like, oh, it's only a couple of dollars. But then that thing adds up, and oh, yeah. it's the same principle for uh, gyms, mm -hmm. right? So when you subscribe at a gym, they know. 65 to 70 percent of the people won't really come mm -hmm. so they are literally only counting on 30 to 35 percent of the people to actually show up regularly everybody else is just free money yeah and that's why membership is so important yeah mm -hmm. and that was one of the things i was talking to a couple of artists is that i you know coach i said you know you have fans but you don't create a membership i said you should create like a monthly membership and service your fans it would save you from having to have to be on the road. Mm -hmm. You can have passive income coming in each month where your fan base can create sustainability. And you can have a healthy revenue stream that is consistently coming in where you can start to design and create your own world for your fan base. But most people don't do that because the cost of maintaining it, the operation course in order to keep it going, and all of this great stuff. Well, what's interesting is that, you know, like, I think, you know, you talked about the future when we were saying, you know, what the future is. I think there is going to be a way that people create their own subscriptions mm -hmm. for their content that you'll choose to now now how they'll get to you that's the part of marketing that they have to figure out is how do i find rashidi hendrix to get me to subscribe five dollars a month you know what's my cost what's my acquisition yeah. cost to get him to subscribe so that but i think in the future that's what's going to happen well and, and see and if i was an artist singing the way some of these people rip it i would have a subscription where it's only like nine dollars a month mm -hmm. and i would make sure each month that i'm dropping two songs that are on that are not released to my general public but just to my exclusive base right 
and I would cater, I would cater to singing to my bass versus singing to the masses. And then I would let my bass determine what will we say that the masses hear. And if you get a million people subscribing to that a month, you get a million people doing a dollar a month, that's a million dollars. Right. Yeah. And that's what a lot of music artists were doing before COVID was that they were independent artists who put music out on Spotify, SoundCloud, all of these various platforms themselves, and they weren't even rushing to get a record deal. I mean, you know, you got to remember from the era we come from, everybody mm -hmm. wanted a record deal. That was yeah. the that was the that was the golden Willy Wonka ticket. Yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm in the chocolate deal. factory. Got a, deal. <laughs> got a deal, right? You know, so now it's like people don't want a deal. I talk to young people now; they're like, I don't think I want a deal. But what they're doing is they're using their YouTube for, uh, views for their videos. They're using all of the music that they have on Spotify that has millions and millions of views, and they're going on the road and making all their money on the road, touring. This, and they don't need a record deal. You don't. Which is I'm, crazy. I mean, I have over 300,000 people wow. on my Facebook fan page. Mm -hmm. I have over a million names on my um, email addresses on the list. And um, All I can tell you is the revenue, the, the, the wealth is out there. There's no reason for no one to be broke if they're the right coaches. Mm -hmm. But I also must say, I paid a lot of money for people to show me how to get the customers, how to manage the list, because a list is like an egg as the hen. If you don't sit on the egg like a mother hen, you're gonna kill the results. Mm -hmm. Wow. You can't start it and stop it. Right. You gotta have the power of consistency and a team that stays consistent on it. And the people have gotta feel like it's reliable. You know, why is it that people will buy a Mercedes over a Chevy or they want a Mercedes or a BMW? It's only one word, and that's trust. Mm -hmm. Why is it that you get Domino Sugar over No Frills Sugar, if they still got No Frills, or whatever? Mm. It's the trust. Why is it that a person will pay $1,000 for a handbag over here and leave the $50 handbag on the, per on the shelf? Because they trust the brand or the model of that handbag that is for a thousand bucks. Why would a person pay five hundred dollars for a pair of eyeglasses or sunglasses or whatever versus thirty dollars trust? And so when it comes down to your name, your product, your service, it's about trust. And that's why we use for twenty years this slogan, if you ever heard us on television, we've we I put this in every one of my slogans. It took years. To, it was like noise to most people. But I put in there, you says, you are most what? Trusted, Trusted name and prophecy. prophecy. Thank you. See, I didn't have to say no more. And I had to begin to brand that because people were so distrusting my name. Mm -hmm. and was temp So I says, I will put at the end of every TV show, I'm Master Prophet, E. Bernard Jordan, your most trusted name in prophecy your most trusted name in prophecy. Because I knew it would take a generation of saying your most trusted name in prophecy until people can begin to trust the prophecy. And in essence, what you were doing was branding yourself with that trust. Yes. Where people now said to themselves, he is the trusted man. And then they, they listened to your words and then they connected with it too. Yes. So that was the consistency part of the trust. Exactly. And we were calling those things which be not as though they were. Then we had, of course, testimonials of people that came mm -hmm. to bear witness of what was happening to say that that is so. But, um, you know, um, a lot of times I'll ask um, an artist or a person I'm coaching in business, what are you known for? And they said, well, I'm known for everything. I can do a little bit of that. I said, okay, you're a jack of all trades, but the master of what? If you've got to become the master of one. What's the one? What is the one that you master? And most people never find their one. 
And that's why there'll be forever a background. Sure. There'll always be somewhere hiding. And there's nothing wrong with background, don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with background. But watch this. The light that penetrates is that which becomes laser. You gotta be a point in order to pierce through where your next step is. Okay, thank you, Rashidi. Thank you. We love these impromptu. They stop by, drive by. You, you gotta, well, listen, now that we know where you live, <laughs> <laughs> we will be, you are a wealth of um, information. And um, are you working on any movies now? Well, um, I just did a deal with Michael Strahan and Tom Brady. So that's my next project. Uh, and this project basically is going to be a, um, it's very similar to Hard Knock on HBO, okay. but for women's football. So oh, there's wow. a whole women's tackle football industry. And we're actually doing a, a series based around these women who play football. But it's basically the same Hard Knock uh, if you're familiar with the show on HBO where they kind of do profiles on NFL teams and the behind okay. the scenes. So it's the behind the scenes of this amazing world of women's tackle football. Well, that's going to be really interesting. That sounds already interesting. I, I, I almost, I, I, I won't go into it now. I have like a couple of questions. I did not even know women even tackled Yeah, football. and they play, they play with a lot of heart. So I was a coach for uh, the New York Sharks, which was one of the teams... Um, that uh, existed for about 20 years. This is women. It's women. Yeah. You mean like they, women? They like hit tackle. hard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, I mean, women. This is, this, I, oh. is, this is full pads. This isn't like, you know, you've heard about the other league, you know, where they just wear the lingerie. This isn't that. This is actual tackle football wow. where they are actually, you know, real linebackers and putting you out. Ends. Right. <laughs> Listen, you know? my son tackled me the other day. I said, give me your best shot. Um, Let's play that. We'll go off with that. My, my grandson um, did that, and I don't know if they have the footage up around. Um, do we have that footage? They're looking for this footage. My grandson says, give me a note. He, he plays football. And KJ, uh, you know, he doesn't know I'm a grandfather. He knows I'm his grandfather. But he, I said, come on, son. Give me your best shot. Let's go. And we was in the hall, and I was like, you know, maybe a bit of 200 pounds. You know, mm -hmm. I said, I changed this kid's pampers. Right. He said, let's go. I said, let's see what you're working with. And um, he showed me what he was working with. And um, I don't know what happened to the second shot. We went at this thing twice. I said, this is like, um, this here... I'm glad I did this at 62 and not at 80. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you, these, these kids are next level. Next level. I, uh, um, we took off and went to, uh, it, it, it went into something else. And I said, okay, this is, this is very, very interesting. Um, let me see if they found that clip. Let's go to this. One, two, three. Get him. Oh, oh, get him! <laughs> One, two, three. Get him. Oh, oh, get him! Oh, get him. <laughs> Halfway down my house. Wow. He's good. When he plays basketball, he does the same thing. Yes. Yeah, I heard he played y'all today. I'm not going to ask y'all what happened. He was playing rugby. He was playing rugby? Listen, these children, are, uh, you know, listen. He, he, well, they're, they're, their team won state championship, what can I tell you? Mm -hmm. So when we got through, I felt like my brain shook in my head. <laughs> I said, this is... That's enough. That's you know, I haven't felt that in my head wow. since the days I did ninjutsu, and I'm a fifth don black belt. I haven't worked out in years. That it felt like you know, like when they would throw you and you're landing and you're slapping out and everything. You know, mm -hmm. you get your head tucked. Um, 
I said, if that's the way y'all are playing football today, you know, when I played football, we did two-hand touch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That, that definitely was not two-hand touch. <laughs> he, he's, he's, uh, he's on his way, let me tell you. And well, still growing, too. Yeah, he's in his last year of high school. Uh, he wants to play football in college. And um, we're going to see what we can do to um, support him. And um, he was mentioning the other day about some people. He says, you know, there's some people taking steroids. And he says, how can I compete with that? I said, very easy. You don't take them. Right. He says, but they're much stronger. I says, maybe stronger in body, but not in integrity. Mm. And so we had to have the integrity conversation, you know. Because always what becomes fast don't oftentimes finish last. And that is the thing that we've got to begin to reinstill is that there was a lot of places where in ministry people said, you should do this, you should do that. But I didn't like the integrity route that it was going. I said, nah, I'd rather do it God's way. This way I won't lack God's supply. At the end of the day, they're on the side of the road fixing flat tires. And we're still moving forward because integrity goes much further in any industry than compromise. Mm -hmm. And um, that has a value in itself. Well, thank you again, Rashidi. Thank you. I and God bless you. That. Amen. And we're going to look forward to more conversations. I will be picking your brain now that we know where you are. Elder, Elder Brett, you, you, how long have you known? Well, so we met in about, what has it been, about maybe? 2000, uh, maybe 14? Yeah, like 13, 14, somewhere in there. Yeah, so, it's around the same time I met my wife. Correct, yeah. correct. And we've traveled together. Uh, we took a trip to California. Uh, That's right. He's just great people. and uh, He's going to be a big help for the music center. Absolutely. Because his... We have to talk. We'll have to yeah. clue him into yeah, but he's, what uh, he signed up for without knowing he signed up for. Right. It. It's amazing how all these pieces are coming together. You know, it's just amazing. It is. However I can serve. All right. Well, there it is. That's all we need to hear. That's all you Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> all right. We'll be right back after this announcement. To keep in touch with Master Prophet E. Bernard Jordan, go to www.bishopjordan.com and follow him on all social media platforms. To get more information about the Prophecology Conference and or more special events, go to www.zoeministries.com or call 888-831-0434. Thank you and stay blessed.